Olivier Reum, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so, uh, interesting things are going on in France at the moment. Um, we had uh, European, uh, we had elections to the European Parliament uh, recently, which uh, had mixed results, I think. Um, uh, you know, they really were, in my opinion, a series of national referenda about a series of national governments. So, uh, unpopular governments in places like Germany um, got punished by the voters. Comparatively popular governments in places from Poland uh, to Greece to Italy um, got reasonably strong results. But perhaps the most uh, shocking outcome was in France. Um, where the uh, party of uh, President Emmanuel Macron uh, cratered to about 15% of the vote. Um, and by by far, uh, the strongest party was the party of Marine Le Pen that had more than double the vote uh, of uh, Macron's party or any other uh, party. Um, as a result, Macron called uh, fresh elections for the Assemblée Nationale. So his presidency is not in doubt, but uh, his parliamentary backing is being put to the test and uh, first polls and projections seem to indicate that uh, Marine Le Pen's party will be by far the strongest faction in the Assemblée Nationale. Um, tell us, uh, Olivier, um, how you see the current situation and perhaps in the more uh, long run, how it is that the far right uh, has gone from being a persistently present but marginal force in French politics to uh, seemingly its uh, first force, its most dominating political faction today? There are two issues. One is uh, the collapse of uh, the political party of President Macron, and the second is the nature of uh, the uh, Rassemblement National of the so-called extreme right. Uh, on the first thing, uh, President Macron never really tried to set up a strong political party. He always, in fact, despised uh, his own uh, partisans. He never gave uh, full support to uh, his own party. And he is now undermining the very base electoral basis of this party because the elected members of the parliament of this party have no real uh, roots uh, uh, in their um, uh, uh, circumscription. Um, so uh, what we'll see is the collapse of the president's party. And he knows that. So, um, in a sense, uh, we may uh, consider that uh, he is playing personal. He is playing uh, his own destiny and his own uh, uh, perspective, and he doesn't care about uh, his own party. The second point uh, is... But, but uh, let, me, uh, let, let me ask a, a couple of follow-up questions here, right? The mm -hmm. first is... Um, how does it serve him? I mean, if he is uh, completely unable to pass anything in the National Assembly, and uh, if after his watch, under his watch, the, 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 the Rassemblement National, the, the party of Le Pen, becomes by far the strongest faction in Parliament, mm. doesn't that both hamstring his presidency and ruin his legacy? And, and more broadly, you know, you're blaming uh, sort of the weakness of Macron's party for this, and I think that's certainly the proximate cause. Um, uh, you know, Macron dominated in the Assemblée Nationale when he was first elected as president. He continued mm -hmm. to have the smallest faction, though significantly reduced after legislative elections two years ago. Uh, and now uh, it looks like his party may fall to about half the deputies it had mm -hmm. to a much smaller share of the parliament. But there's a much more long-standing set of developments here, right? I mean, the Parti Socialiste used to be a major force in the French Parliament. Now it's the junior coalition partner in a popular front of the left. Uh, you know, the UMP, as it was called at one point, Les Républicains were called now. The sort of classic center-right party in France used to be a dominating uh, force in the French Parliament. Now they may become a junior partner in a far-right uh, coalition, or at least a coalition with uh, Le Pen's party. So there's a much broader sort of death of uh, long-standing French established parties uh, that goes beyond uh, what's happening to Macron's party, isn't there? Yeah, what we see is a collapse of the centre, centre-right and centre-left. The Socialist Party was centre-left and uh, a part of uh, 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 the traditional uh, right party, conservative right, were also centre-left. 
and Macron won uh, uh, seven years ago uh, by joining, you know, the center left, the center, so the two centers, the center right and center left. And we see that uh, this uh, uh, part of the uh, electorate is still here. Uh, Macron's party is 14 and the socialist party is 14 percent also. So we still have, you know, uh, uh, 30 percent of uh, uh, center people who still are present on the uh, electoral map. The problem is that they are not really represented. Uh, why? Because on both sides, the extreme, uh, the extremes took uh, the lead. On the left, it's uh, Mélenchon with its uh, uh, ultra-leftist, uh, the France Insoumise, and on the right is Marine Le Pen. So the big failure of Macron was to have been unable to keep together the centre-right and centre-left. And why? Uh, it's because he played on the right. You know. He made the same mistake than Sarkozy, the same mistake than François Hollande, uh, to think that in order to undermine Marine Le Pen party, one should take uh, uh, the same uh, uh, slogans, the same priorities, fighting immigration, fighting Islam, and so and of course, they all lost. You know. uh, uh, they, in fact, uh, comfort Marine Le Pen, and they didn't get any new voters by adopting a part of the electoral program of Marine Le Pen. So, uh, 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 you know, there's a number of serious political scientists who believe some version of this thesis. Um, I know that Cherry Berman, who's a occasional guest on this podcast, for example, believes that um, you know, when uh, more centrist parties take up themes of the right, they, they only strengthen the right. Um, you know, I'm slightly skeptical of that thesis uh, for two reasons. Because first of all, you should expect if that's the case for voters who are not uh, convinced by these themes to move left, um, for the left to be strengthened by them. But what we're actually seeing is the opposite, that uh, political discourse is drifting to the right in good part because particularly in Europe, on questions of immigration and, yes, on questions of Islam, uh, the electorate keeps moving to the right. Um, so rather than voters who used to work vote for a center-left party, um, uh, you know, moving towards the left because they feel that their values are being betrayed by the uh, rightization of these parties, uh, they, what we actually see is that the, by far and away the strongest uh, political force in the traditional milieu and electorate of uh, social democratic parties is now the far right. That, you know, uh, uh, indigenous working class voters, uh, French uh, working class voters who have ancestors in France, German working class voters who have ancestors in Germany, now vote for the far right rather than for those left wing parties. So something about that um, doesn't seem to match up. And then the second point is that I wonder whether it exaggerates the role and the importance that these mainstream politicians have. I think this assumes that somehow because these established politicians um, you know, are willing to echo some of the themes of the far right or in some ways change the position on questions like immigration or to acknowledge that there are some problems with political Islamism in Europe, for example, that completely changes the nature of public discourse. And if only they held the line, then voters wouldn't have the concerns they have. And I, I just think that especially in an age of social media and very free-reading political discussion, that overstates the impact that those kind of forces might have on the public discourse. So tell me where, where I go wrong in that interpretation, particularly perhaps when it comes to France. Yeah, because it's a bit particular in France. Uh, we have a so-called extreme right, Marine Le Pen, and a so-called extreme left, Mélenchon. So uh, the voters of the um, centre are uh, shifting to the right because the left, uh, Mélenchon, is not credible for, the, for different reasons. But uh, uh, now the question is, what is exactly the extreme right? Because we have two parties on the extreme right, so-called extreme right. We have Marine Le Pen and we have Zemmour. Zemmour uh, uh, did only 5%, uh, but the real extreme right is with Zemmour and has uh, slowly uh, left the Front National, because the Rassemblement National, because they uh, uh, consider that Marine Le Pen uh, shifted too much towards the centre. So we have this split in the extreme right, which g uh, gave more legitimacy, or I would say, uh, which allowed Marine Le Pen to appear as more moderate. Um, 
and there is a big uh, something which is very uh, uh, specific to France. It's laicity, mm? uh, which means political secularism. Uh, normally, the left is more open to uh, multiculturalism, to uh, immigration than the right. But in France, what we uh, have seen during the last 15 years is a radicalization, a secular radicalization among the left. Uh, uh, normally not against migrants, but against Muslims. Uh, but given the fact that the uh, bulk of the immigration is made of Muslims, we have now this confusion between migrants and Islam. And if the left is not uh, vocal against migrants, it has been very, very vocal against Islam. So the common point between Marine Le Pen and Macron and a part of the Socialist Party is their hostility to Islam as a religion. And uh, the three of them, uh, uh, I would say uh, the Marine Le Pen, Macron, and a part of the uh, Socialist Party, adopted a strong secularist position. They have that in common. That's the main point they have in common. You know? While Mélenchon is more multiculturalist, more open to Islam, not as a religion, but, you know, as a, a kind of a multiculturalist approach, and Zemmour is pro-Christianity. Zemmour, who is not a Christian, uh, uh, claims that we should restore a Catholic France. So uh, the bulk of the traditionalist Catholics are voting Zemmour. They are not voting uh, for uh, uh, Marine Le Pen. They consider that Marine Le Pen has shifted towards uh, secularism. So um, let me do one note of explanation and then a question to you, just on the note of explanation for those who are not as familiar with the French party system, and particularly Eric Zemmour, who is a relatively new entrant into French politics. You know, Marine Le Pen, of course, is the daughter of Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, the inheritor, um, both in institutional and in personal terms, of the most long-running far-right movement in France after World War II. Um, you know, Jean-Marie Le Pen was clearly a far-right figure, um, uh, skeptical of many aspects of the French Republic, um, including its uh, concept of laicity, uh, anti-Semitic, um, uh, making excuses for the Vichy regime. Uh, Marine Le Pen has been trying at this point for 15 or so years uh, to undertake the, the, the project of, uh, I, I might butcher this French word, de diabolos. De What's the word, Olivier? Oh. De diabolisation. <laughs> de diabolisation. Um, my friend is reasonably de strong, but this word, de diabolisation, this word I always stumble over. So trying mm. to um, mm. uh, sort of make the, the party less, 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 less toxic, making it less appear, less mm. like the devil. She has now been overtaking on the right by Eric Zemmour, mm. who is uh, Jewish as it happens, um, mm. made his name as uh, a writer and a polemicist mm. um, and entered uh, the political uh, mm -hmm. scene. Um, so there are genuine questions about uh, sort of how extreme Marine Le Pen remains at this point. She certainly started in a more extreme way, but she threw her father out of a party. She has at this point consistently been trying to um, emphasize her relative moderation. I think there's real questions about what that would mean if she did become president, as is likely in, in 2027. So um, store that as question number one, Olivier. And then question number two, um, explain to American listeners uh, what the concept of laicity actually entails in France. As you're pointing out, this is the concept that now uh, is very important to a large uh, range of a political spectrum from mm. parts of the Parti Socialist to the left to um, Les Républicains um, and perhaps uh, even big parts of Marine Le Pen's movement on the right. Um, it's rejected on the far right by Eric Zemmour. It's rejected on the multiculturalist left by mm -hmm. um, uh, Jean-Luc Jean Mélenchon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I understand that you're somewhat critical of the interpretation of a concept of laicity in, in France. I also worry that the American reading of it is often completely caricatural and unfair. So explain sort of in good faith terms what the concept means and where perhaps you see its, its, its limits or its flaws. Uh, first, Marine Le Pen has uh, succeeded in uh, appearing more uh, uh, centrist, more moderate, 
and uh, taking her distance with the, uh, uh, her father's party. Uh, the issue is, is it real? Is it in depth? Uh, we don't know. But in terms of uh, 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 visibility, uh, she has succeeded and it explained largely uh, uh, the rise of uh, uh, her party in the elections. The second point. Well, let, me, uh, sorry, <laughs> l l let me double click on that just for a second. Um, she certainly has succeeded in changing the perception of her party. You say you're unsure about the extent to which it's true. Um, right now, it's probably more likely than not that Marine Le Pen will be the next president of France. H how worried are you personally about that prospect? <sighs> Less worried than my uh, colleagues and friends, who are all thinking that we are back to the 30s and uh, we are uh, uh, threatened by some sort of uh, Mussolinian or even Hitlerian, you know, uh, uh, future. Uh, I'm looking from a pers European perspective. I am presently living in Italy. And uh, we have uh, Melanie. Yeah. Melanie is Marine Le Pen. Mm -hmm. uh, same story of uh, genealogy in terms of party. The, her party was a former fascist party. Um, and she um, is certainly uh, conservative, reactionary, etc., etc. Uh, but she is very careful not to use any kind of uh, rightist ideology. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, she's playing on a representation, she's uh, uh, speaking nicely of uh, Mussolini, but in terms of uh, uh, effective uh, uh, policy, uh, uh, we have uh, almost nothing of fascist. So. Um, my view is that we, the mistake now we all do in Europe is to see uh, most of the uh, extreme right parties are fascist parties. No, we are confronted with now with a new extreme right. The, the populists are quite different from the fascists uh, uh, before. The modern populists, they don't want a different society. They don't want, you know, uh, a new man. They don't want an, uh, uh, to create a new Europe, a new ideology, and so. They want to protect what they call their way of life, mode de vie, way of life. In Belgium, in Italy, in Poland, in Poland is a bit different. In Denmark, you know, uh, in Holland, they all speak about keeping our way of life. And of course, this way of life is largely connected with the uh, uh, supremacy of the white men, of course, by definition, you know. It's a way of life that is protected against migrants and against uh, uh, Muslims. But it's not, they are not advocating a new society. They are very conservative, they are nostalgic, more nostalgic than conservative. And uh, from that, they have two options. One is to see, you know, the uh, golden years, the historical past of Europe in the Christian Europe. Uh, it's uh, the PIS in Poland, of course. It's uh, Zemmour, it's Vox in Spain, you know, and it's, uh, to some extent, Salvini uh, in Italy. So in every European country, we have a small fringe of the extreme right, uh, which explicitly advocate a return to Christian Europe. And the church is itself very divided. But in fact, what do we see? And we look at the elections. Everywhere uh, uh, where the populists win, it's when they have given up the reference to a Christian Europe. Uh, the more obvious, you know, uh, event is in Poland. The uh, peace was uh, uh, explicitly trying to recreate a Catholic Poland based on, on uh, uh, the rules of the church, you know, anti-abortion, uh, traditional family. They lost, you know. Uh, same thing in Italy. Uh, 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 Salvini uh, is on decline because he was referring to uh, Christianity. And he claims to be more Catholic than the Pope, which was a big uh, political mistake in Italy. Melanie is totally different. Melanie doesn't embody like Marine Le Pen. She doesn't embody the traditional Christian family. Uh, she is not married. Uh, she has a, a, a daughter outside the wedlock. Uh, and uh, uh, she has an autonomous life as an executive woman. Well, same thing for Marine Le Pen. Um, so, um, and in one, one, one uh, insensation of this, um, Georgia Maloney, uh, in, in a very public way, split up from her romantic partner after he was caught on camera making um, sort of derogatory comments about women. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, the the winning populists know that our societies have changed since the sixties, and that you know 
uh, uh, sexual freedom is considered now a part of our way of life. It's obvious in Holland, they elected Gerd Wilders with a pro-LGBT guy, yeah, or at least a pro-gay uh, 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 guy. He claims to be a feminist. Uh, same thing in Denmark. It's not the populist, it's the Social Democrat Party. But the Social Democrat Party of Denmark has the strongest anti-immigrants and anti-Islam policy in all Europe, including Poland, you know, the strongest anti-immigrant uh, uh, policy. Uh, so everywhere, um, the, the populists are defending not the return to the Europe of the uh, 30s, but the return to the Europe of the uh, after the 60s. Uh, they, uh, so, so in, a pushing... sense, in, in a sense, mm. it makes it sound like they are small c conservative. There's a, um, a strange paradox in conservatism um, that if uh, you take the label of a movement literally, but you're trying to conserve something, mm. the question mm. inevitably becomes, well, what is it that you're trying to conserve? And so you're always going to have splits within conservative movements. Mm. Are we trying to conserve or go back to the Europe of the 1920s or perhaps the Europe of the 1950s? Um, or are we saying, no, actually, what traditional Europe is at this point is the Europe after the student movements of the 60s, after sexual uh, liberation after the feminist movement uh, succeeded. And so what we're trying to preserve is actually uh, the golden age of the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and in part because of the influence of uh, Islam in Europe, uh, I agree with you that the more successful right-wing movements have settled on the Europe of the 1970s and 1980s in cultural terms as the reference point because that also uh, uh, allows them, and it's interesting to, to, to debate to what extent there are real concerns there, um, to say that it is actually the influx of much more conservative and religious immigrants who are threatening the what is now seen as the hallmark of traditional Europe, namely um, uh, the role of women in society, the freedoms for sexual minorities, and so on. And it helps to explain why in many European countries, it's not just the young people, who now vote for the, uh, for that part of the right in significant numbers, uh, but often sexual minorities, sometimes um, immigrants and ethnic minorities that aren't from Muslim majority countries. Yeah, of course, they construct Islam as a conservative, anti-feminist, anti-LGBT culture. And they consider that uh, as long as you are a Muslim, you share this culture. They uh, uh, may consider that assimilation is possible for some of these uh, Muslims, but uh, that there could be no uh, uh, cultural sharing, you know. Um, it's um, it's important to see what what they want. They want to enjoy, but to enjoy between themselves, not to share, I would say that. Uh, they claim to uh, follow uh, uh, European values, uh, but they consider, they turn these values as an identity. It's no more universal values. Uh, we are uh, uh, feminist, they are not feminist, so we don't share. No. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, share the same society. And the extreme right, the Christian extreme right, is very unhappy about that, you know. Uh, uh, they are fighting a rear guard uh, uh, struggle against the evolution of the populist. Uh, you have a strong now, um, the, in France, for instance, uh, the debate is about uh, 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 Marion Maréchal. Marion Maréchal is the niece of uh, uh, Marine Le Pen, but she has joined Zemmour's party and she claims to be a practicing Catholic. Although she is not married, but it's another story. Uh, she claims to be a practicing Catholic, and she is anti-abortion, anti-same-sex marriage, etc., etc. And uh, the uh, 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 the debate now at the extreme right is where is she? Uh, will she stay with Zemmour or uh, will she join Marine Le Pen? But Marine Le Pen doesn't want an agreement with Zemmour. She understands that she has more to lose on the uh, center than on the extreme right. Uh, so um, uh, we have, a, in, in some, to some extent, a coalition of values based on the so-called laicité from Marine Le Pen to the right of the Socialist Party. And even so explain, if the, so explain laicité 
to an American audience or to an international audience um, in ways that uh, perhaps are more subtle than what you sometimes read in uh, the main papers in the United States, for example. Yeah, the law on laicity, 1905, was the law of separation of church and state. So it was a constitutional principle with legal consequences, uh, but it uh, said nothing about uh, uh, what is France, uh, uh, what are the uh, uh, values of the French society, etc. The law just organized, you know, uh, the uh, uh, separation by uh, stating what is allowed in terms of uh, uh, public uh, religious practices, what is not allowed, you know? and the law worked quite well until uh, the 90s. Uh, and suddenly in the 90s, a new term did appear in French politics, the values of the republic. It's totally a new term, because from a constitutional point of view, there is no values attached to the republic. The republic is a principle of a, a constitutional system. It's not based on values. Uh, and this stress on values has been... Um, accented during the last uh, 20 years, especially uh, uh, with the confrontation of terrorism, Islamic terrorism. So all the presidents from right and from the left, they say, uh, now every French citizen should accept the values of the Republic. Uh, what does it mean? Yeah. And clearly, uh, the interpretation, which is not official, there is no text, is that if you have religious beliefs, you don't you don't have to, you should not show these beliefs in the public sphere. You should keep religion private. And you should uh, uh, accept you know, the uh, idea that uh, it's a liberal society. Uh, um, uh, and then they stop because they don't know how to define which, what is this liberal society. We, have a, we had a debate on same-sex marriage. So it shows that there is no unanimity on same-sex marriage. There is no uh, 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 unanimity on, for uh, instance, uh, um, uh, euthanasia or on abortion, etc., etc. So they are unable to define what are the values of the Republic. But they all stress, and, Mar uh, and the president uh, uh, today uh, 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 spoke about enforcing secularism, enforcing laicity. Why he did that? Because he knows that he has that in common with Marine Le Pen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so this could be the basis of a shared power. Mm -hmm. They agreed on that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so laicity is, uh, has been turned uh, by both the right and the center into some sort of French ideology. This is the culture, the political culture of the nation, which is a big problem because uh, 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 it excludes, uh, it excludes believers, not just Muslims, but a, a big part of the traditional Catholics, for instance, consider that this uh, 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 principle uh, of uh, 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 defending the values of the Republic is turned also against Catholicism. And it's true, and it's true, you know. Uh, there are more pressure on uh, uh, Catholic parents who keep children, who, who uh, make uh, homeschooling. Uh, there are more pressure on the uh, exhibition of uh, Christian signs uh, in the public sphere, etc., etc. Mm. So what we are heading towards is some sort of uh, uh, official <laughs> atheism, if I can say that, you know, uh, which has both extreme right uh, uh, roots, mm, the pagans, mm, and uh, extreme left uh, roots uh, also. The, the funny thing is that now the center mm, is embracing this concept uh, of uh, national republican values, which uh, uh, means exclusion of religion. And who, of course, are the most concerned by the exclusion of religion? The Muslims by definition, because they are the more visible and far more numerous than the uh, 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 conservative Catholics. So now, uh, laicity is a code word to say we don't want Islam. So um, let's pick up a little bit here. So the first uh, point is that I agree with you, you know, following French public debates, that sometimes this expression, uh, so I was... I live next to a fire station, so um, there's pretty loud fire uh, trucks right now. Let's wait it out for a second. You can still hear them, right, Brennan?
By the way, uh, I am recording. It's recording on my... Um... <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> and when you look uh, above your uh, picture, perhaps above my picture on your screen, um, what percentage uploading does it say on Riverside? Sorry? Oh, do you see there should be a, a sign that says percent uploading? Like I at the moment have 99% uploading. Can you see how many percent yeah, yeah, uploading yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I see the sign. 99. And how many percent? Is it 99 or? 99. Oh, perfect. Great. All right. That means there's no problem with mm -hmm. speed. All right. Is it far enough away now, Brandon? It's, it's a big fire. <laughs> it's, still, it's still visible. I, I, I have trouble hearing Brandon. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Let's wait for a little bit longer. Mm. <clears throat> My apologies about that. I guess the sirens are made to pierce through anything, and indeed they do. Um, mm. All right. Um, da, 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 da. Let's back up here a, a, a little bit. So I agree with you, you know, following um, French public debates in some amount of detail, that this phrase, les valeurs de la République, the values of a republic, is often uh, uh, intoned in strange ways and perhaps sometimes abused. I remember one debate in which uh, there was an attempt um, to uh, reform the French school system, which uh, involves a lot of frontal uh, instruction, mm. a lot of uh, learning things off by heart. Uh, and one of the suggestions was that there should be less... Uh, time spent with a teacher lecturing students and more time on group work and other kinds of things. And a number of prominent French intellectuals mm. uh, denounced mm. this at, as an attack on the valeur de la République. And I thought, whatever the merits or demerits of that educational reform, that seems like a very strange way of uh, framing the, the dissent. Um, uh, I am trying to give a slightly more sympathetic understanding of the difference between the French approach to laicity and the American conception of a separation of, of uh, church mm. and state, for, right? I mean, in the United States, the problem of departure was that you had people of many different religious sects, mostly Christian, but of many mm. different denominations, trying to figure out how they can live together. And so the biggest worry was about an establishment mm. of one mm. religion. Uh, of the state officially saying this is the religion you have to follow. And that led to the particular kind of um, guarantees of freedom of religion that uh, mm. uh, an American audience in particular will be used to. Right? In France, the problem of departure, um, you know, including in the beginning of the 20th century when the original law on laicity mm. was passed, was rather different. You had one hugely dominating religion that was hugely dominating in the state and was hugely dominating in uh, society as a whole. And so the question of how you can make space for people from religion, how we can make sure the public sphere isn't so dominated by that religion that people who are secular um, uh, don't, have, don't have effective freedom to lead their lives uh, was at the forefront of how people are thinking about it. And so, uh, in my understanding, the French concept of laicity from the beginning has always been about sort of limits to the ways in which religion is going to be a public and a political manner. It's trying to insulate a sphere of public and political life from the private religiosity of citizens that they should be able to continue. Now, I, in many ways, am more American. I share some concerns about ways in which um, the French conception, particularly as used in the last uh, few decades, has put excessive limits on ways in which private citizens can be uh, open and visible about their religious faith, faith, faith in the public sphere, which I do think is an important element of a freedom of religion. But I do wonder whether that historical rooting should make us a little bit more sympathetic about the arguments that are being made, and whether we shouldn't also recognize that you know, there are parts of France and there's parts of other European countries now where, for example, if you are a uh, girl from um, uh, an immigrant background in a neighborhood with people, um, uh, uh, you know, who are Muslim immigrants, who uh, many of whom are strongly religious or at least are using that as a form of social control, there's going to be a lot of pressure put on you. Uh, to engage, not engage in certain behaviors. Um, and that can, in fact, severely limit uh, the freedom 
uh, of people in our society. And so there is a role for the state in ensuring that citizens are protected against the tyranny, not only of the state, but as liberal thinkers from John Stuart Mill onward realized, the tyranny of society, whether it's the majority society um, or whether it is the, uh, you know, the society that may happen, may happen to be a majority in your social network or in your neighborhood. So how do we sort of balance the legitimate concerns that motivated the law of laicity in the early 20th century at the time of the dominance of the Catholic Church um, and I think the legitimate concerns about how to make sure that people aren't coerced into a compliance uh, with uh, uh, certain behaviors supposedly sanctioned by Islam in certain neighborhoods in Europe um, with a more robust defense of freedom of worship that doesn't accept the limits that perhaps have uh, now become customary in, 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 in some, uh, uh, among some political parties in France. Well, uh, in France, as uh, everywhere, uh, there are social pressures in uh, specific places, um, uh, a small village, a neighborhood, and so you may have social pressures uh, uh, to repress uh, comportments, attitudes, which are not uh, uh, in line uh, with uh, what the people see as a good thing to do. Uh, so when we have a huge uh, 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 Muslim presence in a small neighborhood, you have some pressure. But it's largely exaggerated for uh, political reasons. First, there is a mobility. Um, the youth is living, going elsewhere, etc. Many uh, uh, second generation have, uh, they have a dual life uh, with the family. They are, uh, 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 they look like uh, uh, good Muslims, but then they, they go uh, uh, outside the neighborhood and they are uh, totally uh, different. But something which is important, we have a crisis of religions, you know. Uh, uh, the social pressure ex exercised by religion is diminishing precisely because the people are less and less uh, uh, involved in religious practices. Of course, there is um, a, a, a gap between the decrease among uh, uh, Christians, which is done now. Uh, we can say that uh, the society is no more Christian. Less than 5% uh, of the uh, French people still go to church, which is almost nothing. The number of practicing people is higher uh, among uh, Muslims. So, uh, but uh, we have a sociological evolutions which are not taken into consideration. For instance, the rise of a Muslim middle class. Um, the people with degrees, diplomas, uh, professional activities, and so and so. If we, if you look, you know, at uh, any kind of um, uh, um, uh, uh, professional uh, uh, books, you know, you, uh, the list of uh, lawyers, the list of medical doctors, the list of surgeons, you see that now there is a huge proportion of Muslims in uh, uh, French hospital, for instance, in my hometown in France, in Dreux. Uh, the, uh, you have more uh, uh, Muslim surgeons than non-Muslim sur surgeons. So we have the gentrification of a part of uh, uh, rising part of the uh, Muslim population, which is not acknowledged. And these people, when they have, uh, they kept the faith, they practice, I would say, like uh, modern conservative Jews or uh, conservative Catholics. Uh, they don't put pressure on the neighborhood because they are living in a very diverse uh, 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 neighborhood. So um, this idea that uh, we should protect uh, the youth uh, from uh, the generation of the parents uh, with, uh, who Im impose on them uh, uh, Islam doesn't correspond uh, to what is going on in the society. The problem is not uh, too strong social pressure. The problem is social disintegration. Uh, the disappearance of traditions and uh, 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 religious pressure. Uh, now, more and more, the, the born again, the, the, the more radical Muslims are born again. Uh, it means that there are uh, uh, young people who were not specially Muslims and who decide to uh, become born again Muslims and who then critique, are critical of their parents because they consider that their parents are not Muslim enough. That's the real problem. It's not the uh, uh, preservation of traditions. It was the case 20 years ago. Uh, but now it's not the case. Uh, what we have is a deculturation of uh, migrants 
and uh, which is parallel, you know, with what did happen in France uh, uh, concerning uh, um, Christianity. Christianity was part of the landscape. When I was a young boy, we had nuns, uh, we had priests with a cassock, uh, we had people going uh, to, to the church. When I was at school, I was Protestant. When I was at school, at the time of uh, um, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, communion, you know, the, the first Eucharist, uh, we were only six boys to stay uh, in the classroom. All the others were uh, uh, in the church, and it was a state secular church. There was no problem at that time. You know. So now, uh, uh, religion appears as something weird, and that's the big difference with the uh, United States. In the USA, you still have visible uh, uh, religious practices and beliefs by, by uh, maybe not the majority of the people, but religion is considered as a not only socially acceptable, but as socially positive. In France, it's exactly the contrary. You know. There is a profoundly anti-religious feeling among the population. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is on this basis uh, that uh, the right is trying to uh, constitute an electoral support. No, it's not about uh, uh, Christianity, it's about laicity. And that's uh, it's the same debate in Belgium, Holland, etc. Uh, what is uh, what is left for religious freedom now? That's a real question because the religious people are in a minority everywhere. We've naturally arrived to the title of your latest book, which is the crisis of culture. What do you mean by a culture, particularly a kind of national culture, and why is it in crisis? A culture is what I call a shared implicit in a community. This community can be, you know, a nation, an ethnic group, a religious group, what you want, you know, a village, a country. Uh, and a shared implicit means that you have a language, for instance, you speak the language, and you don't put the rules of the language into questions. Uh, even if you disagree, you disagree by using the same language, and uh, 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 everybody understands uh, the uh, uh, other. Um, uh, we share uh, uh, same, uh, for instance, a common body language. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, we can hate each other, but we show this hatred by using the same body language. Uh, when uh, we uh, look at emotions, we name, we give names to the emotion, the same names. You know, we, we know what it means uh, to be happy, to be unhappy, etc., etc. Uh, uh, what I see now is the disappearance, uh, or at least the containment, of anything which is a shared implicit. Uh, starting with language. It's not the first time in history that a language become, becomes an uh, international language. Latin, at the time of the Roman Empire, uh, and during all the Middle Age, French was the European uh, international language in the uh, 18th uh, century. And now it's something that we still call English. But it's not English. Uh, it's globish, what I call globish. What is the difference? When we learned Latin, when we learned French, we also learned the Latin culture and the French culture. Okay. Of course, it was an elite uh, culture. Of course. But learning a language meant learning a culture. Now, the international English is no more connected with uh, uh, the cultural English. You don't need to know Shakespeare to speak, and more than that, it's better not to know Shakespeare uh, if you want to be understood by the other people. So what we have is a self-simplification of uh, English, by using something between 1,000 and 2,000 terms. Uh, it doesn't mean that the people do not speak good English, but even when you sp think to speak good English, you simplify your own English because you are not sure that the other guy speaks good English. So we have this kind of uniformization of uh, uh, globish uh, in um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, simplification, not only of the number of words, but by using words in non-equivocal uh, dimension. That, uh, so you cannot joke, you cannot make jokes now, uh, 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 because it's equivocal. Now. And you transform the language into a code, which means that uh, the uh, word and the meaning should be univocal, uh, that a word means a word. Yes is yes, no is no. 
and you cannot, you know, uh, add nuances between yes and no, maybe, maybe not, etc. It's not, it's like, you know, the uh, 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 driving uh, uh, cord. Uh, red light is a red light, and uh, 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 green light is a green light. You cannot make jokes or change allusion. So, so now it's uh, 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 what is uh, 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 becoming the rule. Another example: emotions. Now, emotions are expressed by different form of body language, by your way of speaking, by allusions, etc., etc. Uh, now, you, when you want to mention an emotion, you have to make it explicit. So you use an emoji or an emoticon. The people in front of you, uh, your correspondent, has to understand that you are angry, or you are happy, uh, or you are half bitter. So you can make some nuances, but the meaning has to be absolutely explicit. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in this uh, kind of uh, communication, culture is what has to be ignored. You, know, you may have a culture. You may share a culture with uh, uh, friends we, uh, uh, or even a national culture. But as soon as you enter into the world of Internet, for instance, then you have to give up uh, this uh, 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 culture. So it, the two uh, consequences are what I call codification in the two sense of the term codification. One is explicitation, systematic explicitation of uh, what you do, what you say, what you want. And the other is a transformation of uh, 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 practices uh, into um, uh, 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 normativity. Uh, everything is put under norms. Uh, the examples are very easy to find to every people above 40 years. I ask, look at what, what was your institution, your school, uh, your business, uh, 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 the law of your country, uh, the penal law, the civil law 20 years ago, and look now. Yeah. <laughs> Not only the laws has been extended considerably, but things which were not under law, which were not, you know, uh, adjudicable, are now under law. Mm. Uh, the law of tort, for instance, has been considerably extended uh, during the last uh, 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 20 years. Mm. And when you speak about tort, for instance, emotion and so, precisely you cannot, uh, you have to say everything. You have to give the details of uh, uh, sexual relations, for instance, but you have to express your feelings, your inner feelings, Feelings, uh, in order that everybody understands. So, uh, if we want to take an, some sort of an intellectual uh, uh, comparison, uh, when I was young, psychoanalysis was the culture. Uh, so, the idea, what is very important, is the implicit. Uh, and that we, uh, you know, that the uh, unconscious will always remain some unconsciousness. You know. But that you can, uh, 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 in a way, uh, uh, made some part of this uh, 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 unconscious explicit, but you have to live with your unconscious. No. Now, when you have a problem, you don't go to the uh, psychoanalyst, that are almost criminalized now, uh, you go to Alconic Anonymous. No. And Alconic Anonymous, you have to say everything. Hmm? Uh, you cannot uh, speak of uh, 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 something which is too complex. You have to use the other as benchmarks. No. You have to put your attitude into uh, um, a, a series of benchmarks that have to be respected by all the others. No. What is uh, uh, look at is your explicit uh, uh, words and your explicit behavior, which is quantified. No. That's the big change. And it's a profound so civilizational change. So there's, there's a lot of very interesting material in that. Let me uh, try and pick it apart a little bit, and I'll start with um, uh, one of my favorite silly theories about the world. So I grew up in Germany, and um, well, there's certainly Germans who have a good sense of humor. Humor just is not a big part of a culture. It's not a part of the implicit, as you would say. Um, and so Germans can come across to people from other countries as being uh, very earnest, as indeed many of them are. Um, now, I have a theory that uh, the only country that can, uh, quote-unquote, rescue a German is England. If you go to England, uh, humor is such a big part of the implicit culture of a place, and you are so unable to communicate simply with the uh, 
formal semantic meaning of a sentence. You're so reliant on mm. implicature, on the implied meanings of a turn of phrase, of a turn of voice, mm. of a gesture, mm. that uh, you know either you delve into that culture, including in particular the role that humor plays into it, or you hate it and you go back home. Mm. So a uh, German who, and this is of course a completely self-serving theory since I moved mm. to England as an uh, 18 year old and did my undergraduate there, um, England can, 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 can succeed in giving a German a sense of humor. Now Germans who move straight to the United States are lost cause because mm. America has always been used to having so many people from all over the world mm. come to this country and therefore to dealing not just with people who are very earnest, um, but with people who um, simply won't understand um, the turn of phrase, the gesture, the ironic half smile. Mm. Um, that uh, while there's a lot of very, very funny Americans, including wonderful stand-up comedians, uh, humor is not part of the implicit culture of a country in the same way. Um, and so a German who moves straight to the United States is going to remain earnest and live perfectly comfortably in the United States. And some people might think, oh, this guy's a little bit earnest, but they won't hold it against the person. Um, and so a German who moves straight to the US is not going to acquire a sense of humor. So this is my sort of pet theory that I've had for a long time that you made me um, think of. Why am I mentioning this? Well, two points. I mean, one is I love the United Kingdom in many ways and spent wonderful years there, but it's not clear to me that uh, Britain has a superior culture to the United States, for many of my British friends uh, would insist that it does. Um, and in fact, America has been incredibly successful in the modern world, perhaps in part because the price of entry to its culture is so much lower. Um, more broadly, um, I wonder whether you aren't recreating um, Herder's distinction between culture and civilization, between culture and civilization, because Herder's critique and that of many German romantics in the 19th century as Napoleon expanded his, his influence mm -hmm. over Germany was that we have this thick, grown culture that has a lot of diversity to it. One village has a different culture mm -hmm. from the next. Um, that has the thick understandings that are required mm -hmm. to be a part of it. And the French, with their uh, revolution and the Napoleonic Code, you know, they are the rationalist um, simplifiers who want to hold us all to universal standards mm -hmm. and impinge mm -hmm. on our culture. And so a lot of the mm -hmm. sort of German reaction in the 19th century, mm -hmm. political reaction, but also the reaction against French influence, uh, it, uh, sort of was a... Um, anxiety about the loss of that kind of implicit culture that you're talking about. Now, ironically, you're saying today the inheritor of civilization, of the abstract rationalist civilization in the eyes of Germany that France has become, had, had, you know, you're treating that as the culture and saying that it's threatened by a new kind of civilization in the, in the uh, form of uh, a, a globish influence by, by the United States. So, so, you know, um, I don't know that this is sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, that that, 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 that that historical resonance necessarily invalidates your theory, but I just wonder sort of whether that should make us skeptical about that concern in the present day. I think that this uh, distinction between uh, civilization and culture, which was very strong in the 19th century for the reasons you, you said, is no more working. Mm. Uh, because there is no such a thing as civilization. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, of course, uh, culture still exists, but culture are more and more restricted to small groups, uh, inward-looking groups. It's why we have more and more now cults or uh, populist movements. They want to uh, reconstitute a community of culture, of people who can share uh, without having to justify uh, uh, themselves. And so culture is remain as a, a nostalgia, uh, not as a real, uh, 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 not with a real content. And civilization, we claim to have a civilization, but uh, 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 it doesn't work. You know, the, the big debate on the clashes of civilization, for instance, uh, is, uh, uh, is invalidated precisely by the absence of content when we speak, we try to define a civilization. Uh, when uh, Huntington said that he didn't f foresee a war between Ukrainians and Russians because they share 
uh, the same civilization. Wait, uh, we can see now that uh, that's not exactly the the, the case. Uh, what is called civilization now, the, the use of the term, is in fact more of uh, very often to say that we to, to mention the civilization of human rights. You know this idea that since uh, let's say 45 uh, we have a new global civilization based on uh, human rights, and that it's a universalist uh, uh, civilization. So we have the coming back of the universal standards uh, uh, defined by the French uh, in the uh, 19th uh, century. The problem is that these um, uh, uh, standards are not based on a real uh, society, on a real uh, 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 culture. They are abstract and they are implemented by courts, by rules, by law. Uh, that's the big problem now. Why uh, do the courts play the, such a role now at every level? Uh, not just in the USA, but in, in Europe too. Now we have uh, uh, many Supreme Courts uh, which did not exist uh, uh, before. The role of the American Supreme Court is far bigger than it used to be one century ago. The court was there, but uh, uh, from a, uh, it didn't uh, uh, had the political role that it has now. And it's not just because Trump succeeded uh, in appointing people. Or the, uh, uh, the court is far more complex than, than that. The European Court of Human Rights is playing also a big role, which was not uh, foreseen uh, before. It's because all these principles exist mainly through norms and not because they are accepted values by a given society or a given culture. Uh, uh, norms are replacing values. And so in this case, I think we cannot speak about a civilization. But, but I was less interested in, in using the term of civilization, which um, you know is a different kind of topic of debate. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I note, by the way, that, 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 that Huntington's prediction for Ukraine is a little bit more complicated than you mentioned. He um, said that the, the, the line between what he saw as these two different civilizations ran through mm -hmm. the middle of Ukraine with a more orthodox mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, population in the country's east mm -hmm. and a more Catholic population mm -hmm. in the country's west. And so he did foresee a conflict in that part of the world. He just thought that it would uh, run through mm -hmm. the country. And... Uh, you know, in some ways, that helps to explain what is the likely outcome of this con of this conflict, which is that part of the eastern mm. parts of Ukraine are going to belong to to Russia, and then hopefully there will be. Mm. Um, yeah, let, 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 I don't like that, but Hunting okay. <laughs> um, uh, it, so, so look, I, I agree with your criticism of that use of the term civilization, but I was not interested in trying to say we should use Huntington's concept of civilization mm -hmm. in this context. I was saying, isn't there a parallel between the critique that people like Herder made of a loss of culture and the critique that you're making of the loss of culture today, which is to say that their anxiety was that um, the shared implicit is being lost. And instead, what in their mind the French are imposing on us is this empire of norms and universal values. And what you're diagnosing today seems to me to run in certain ways in parallel. You're saying you know, French culture had this implicit and that's what structured society. That's why we didn't need resource to the courts on everything. Mm. Um, uh, that's why we had uh, you know, a use of language that was deeper, that, that, that went to some of the subtle understandings. And now what we're getting in the wake of that in the loss of that is, you know, globish and uh, a much expanded role of the courts and uh, these fights over abstract universal values. Is, isn't that a parallel critique to the one or a parallel concern to the one that Herder had? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, form, uh, formally yes. But what is uh, in crisis is the Herder's concept of culture. Yeah, the idea that there is a false geist, a spirit of the people, yeah? and this is disappearing. When uh, the, normally you know, the populists uh, should uh, uh, retake uh, in their hands uh, the uh, the ideas of Herder, and sometimes they do when they have uh, some uh, 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 academic knowledge, which is rare. But okay. Uh, uh, but they don't go to that when they are asked to explain 
uh, what is uh, 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 your uh, culture, national culture, and so on, so, what they do. Uh, uh, they never speak, they speak of history, of course, but okay. Uh, uh, they never speak of the uh, something which is deep, uh, de deeply entrenched. They speak of mode de vie, hmm? and uh, they speak of, they use uh, uh, um, a number of uh, uh, a cluster of identity markers. Mm. It's very poor. Bon, let's take Italy. Mm. So they have a culture. <laughs> you know, Italy is a cultural country by definition. But when the populists like uh, Lolo Brigida, uh, the uh, 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 Ministry of uh, 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 Culinary Sovereignty, mm. when he speak about the genius of Italy, what does he do? He supports pizza, for instance. He was really to uh, 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 attack in court, uh, the pizza uh, the pretends that pizza was created in New York, for instance, and he speaks about pizza. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it, it, they do nothing to revivify the literature, the arts, the things like that. Not because they are stupid, uh, they are not interested, they are not interested. So for them, culture is a series of limited markers which are explicit. Mm. Italians eat pizza, okay. Uh, and of course, uh, so they are fighting kebabs. Mm. Uh, uh, the problem is that uh, uh, their electors, uh, they go also to kebabs. <laughs> no, it's not just the tourists. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, Marine Le Pen is speaking of uh, 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 Jeanne d'Arc, of uh, eating pork. Uh, and you see who is, uh, of course, uh, targeted by uh, the virtue of uh, eating pork. Um, uh, UNESCO, for instance, is playing uh, unwillingly, um, uh, unwittingly uh, in this game. UNESCO has decided that the baguette, you know, the French uh, long bread, is now a part of the international cultural heritage. So, uh, what we have now is uh, reducing culture to a limited uh, cluster of markers. For instance, what is defined as uh, when Muslims in Europe are fighting to uh, uh, obtain the recognition of a Muslim minority? What they are fighting for? For the veil. For the veil. You know? And for halal food. And some, uh, they are uh, fighting for visible markers and practices. But nothing about philosophy, nothing about theology, nothing about literature, nothing. It's what I call uh, the flattening of the world. You know? hmm. Um, how does identity politics play into your conception? You have a way of uh, reconceptualizing uh, what the quote unquote woke movement is trying to do as a move, as I understand it, not within a culture, but rather of imposition of norms upon cultures. Explain what you mean by that and how that gives you a kind of ambivalent view about those uh, attempts. Identities, the term identity and identity politics uh, is very recent. You know. uh, if you look at the uh, academic literature, the terms appears, um, appeared in the 70s uh, uh, to, to be uh, widely used. You know, Before the 70s, it was, it was not widely used. So suddenly, we have a problem uh, with identity from the 70s. And it's connected with the crisis of the 60s, uh, with the deculturation, the dechristianization, um, uh, uh, and so identity now are reconstruct a reconstructed a long uh, limited set of explicit markers. Uh, it's why, for instance, race is um, uh, 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 becoming uh, is not becoming a, a stake. It has always been, uh, but there is a big problem now of uh, who is black. <laughs> Uh, because the, the markers have to be very cle clearly identified. Mm. Before it was quite easy. Mm. Uh, uh, and the people who were hybrid and so and so were not uh, uh, acknowledged. Same, sec for, uh, same thing for gender. Mm. Uh, you had male and female. So now uh, you uh, people claim to belong to uh, other groups. Mm. Uh, but how to define the groups? It's always by taking a limited set of uh, um, uh, identity markers. And you don't make a culture uh, by uh, aligning you know, a limited set of uh, uh, identities. So it's why now the identities are conflictual. To have an identity, I should have somebody who is not uh, this identity. It's far more conflictual. And that uh, uh, you have... The fight for uh, the monopoly of these identity markers, um, uh, uh, um, cultural appropriation, um, 
is very funny also. Cultural appropriation didn't make sense uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, when uh, um, a famous um, uh, English, um, James Oliver, you know, uh, is speaking now about uh, his own way to make a jerk uh, 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 cooking, then you have a protest by the people of Jamaica, or uh, the people who claim to represent the Jamaicans, and to say you have no right to use the term jerk because it belongs to us, uh, the real ones. So, uh, uh, same thing for the pizza in Italy, uh, etc. Uh, so now what we have is identity communities which are fight, uh, defining themselves by a small cluster of uh, identity markers and defending you know, these uh, uh, identity markers against the others. Hmm. Um, so if sort of culture, including the culture of smaller groups, gets flattened into these identity markers, um, what does that mean for our contestation about the rules and the norms that should govern our society? Um, uh, you know, we're certainly far away from an implicit agreement on those that ever existed. Um, uh, what do you think are the implications of this way of viewing the current set of cultural debates, or if you want, culture wars in the West? for how we can have a stable and fair settlement of them. The problem is that uh, this um, uh, competition between uh, identities, uh, uh, the consequence is that people ask for more rules. Mm -hmm. uh, the cancel culture is typical uh, of that. Uh, in order to recognize the sufferings of a given uh, uh, group, then we need rules. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, which should uh, punish or console what you want. But it's not a leftist concept. It's exactly the same on the right. You know? uh, De Santis, the governor De Santis, is also using his uh, own cancel culture to forbid the teachings of the race relations and things like that in Florida. So um, on both sides, and for me, that's uh, uh, my main concern, people they all speak about freedom, but they're not fighting for freedom. They're fighting for more rules. Uh, and uh, the issue is who is the winner? The debate is about domination. The, um, the so-called walks, um, uh, 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 they say we have the right to call for rules because we are dominated. We are the suffering people. And of course, uh, the uh, white supremacists, they say, uh, no, uh, now we are in the minority, we are the uh, suffering people, so we need rules to protect our identity. So the debate about who is dominant, who is a good guy, you know, uh, and uh, uh, conflict, uh, I take the worst, uh, 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 the conflict about Gaza, for instance, um, it is not uh, understood in terms of uh, politics, history, uh, 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 real politic, uh, it's, a, it's uh, 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 the debate is done on uh, uh, moral ethics. Who has the right? Who is really suffering? Uh, who is responsible for the sufferings of the author? Who has started, etc., etc. And of course, in this, when you have this kind of uh, approach to a very uh, uh, difficult uh, conflict, you, you cannot find a, a way to do. Yeah. So my um, personal view is that we should return to, uh, to politics, you know, to, to uh, uh, political settlement uh, uh, inside the society, negotiations between groups. So the, the way, for instance, the, the capitalist and the working class have been able, at the end of the 19th uh, century, to start to find a compromise. Yeah. Uh, uh, how states are able to compromise on uh, uh, their borders and so and so. But it's not what we see now. Uh, there is a rejection of compromise uh, at every level of the society. Even the uh, family level, if I can say that, you know. Um, uh, 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 soon as uh, one uh, people think that there is an infringement on his or on own freedom, they, uh, they separate uh, immediately. Uh, uh, the problem is that uh, we have a more and more individualized, uh, individualized society, and so everybody is fighting for his or her own rights. And so we have um, the society is more and more split, uh, not just in groups, but even 
inside the groups, you know, uh, uh, you have the uh, individuals, take, you know, uh, uh, genders. Uh, the, uh, the list of genders is increasing because there is always somebody who said, oh, I am not, uh, uh, I, I don't identify with your list of uh, identities, so I will add my new uh, markers for myself. And at the end, uh, there is uh, no more a society. Olivier Roy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for uh, receiving me.